Hey the fellow markers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Rwanda outside the Volcano National Park where you can actually go see the gorillas. Yeah, the gorillas in the mist, that's here in Rwanda. It is fantastic, an amazing experience. And when I've been here, I've seen all kinds of great Rwandan products, but I've also seen a lot of products I see a lot of places around the world. For example, Skoll, the Brazilian beer. Yeah, they license it here and they brew it here. I've seen Heineken, I've seen Coca-Cola. I saw other fast food joints when I was going around and the thing is it got me thinking man globalization really is everywhere so I thought of what I do is put this video together to talk about the basics of what is globalization and kind of what are some of the driving forces behind globalization so you get an idea of where it's come from and where it might be going okay so if you're not sure what globalization is it basically is kind of the process of international integration. Like it's all coming together from different countries and different cultures and different places, right? And the thing is we're coming together economically. I mean, think about it. When you're watching the economic news, they talk about the FTSE in England. They talk about the, the CAC 40, the, the CAC 40 in France. They'll talk about the Hang Seng Index. They'll talk about all kinds of other places to go along with the Dow Jones market, right? And so economically we're becoming more and more integrated. I mean, your bank, is your bank from the US? Is your bank from Germany? Where, where's it from? Where's the controlling interest? It can be from all over because we're becoming more economically integrated, right? But also socially and culturally, we're becoming more integrated as well. I mean, think about it. A few years ago, Psy, right? The Wumbum Gangnam style, you know, the, the Korean singer. Like, that was a huge song everywhere in the world. Like, and I'm going to guess most of the people that sang along Wumbum Gangnam style had no clue what the heck the guy was talking about. But they love that beat, right? Because you know what? The love of good music, that's something that crosses all borders, right? And so culturally, it's a lot easier for that to cross over. Then Despacito came and that was another huge hit. And that was when it was all over the world. And we're seeing that, yeah, there's things that we like and that are very common among all of us. And we're really becoming more and more integrated together, socially, culturally, and economically. And so we see these things. But when we look at it, how is it that, you know, my favorite phone is coming from South Korea and my favorite food is coming from Mexico or Italy or something like that? Where do these things come from? Well, if you look at some of the drivers of globalization, one of the things you want to look at is the reduction of trade barriers really made it a lot easier for products from all over the world to travel all over the world, okay? Because think about it, if, if the tariffs are low, if there's no tariffs, it's easier for me to ship my product to another market because it doesn't have any, any, any extra taxes put on top of it so I can compete easier, right? So that's gonna make it easier. Also, some countries used to have quotas. It said only a certain number of products can come in from that country. I mean, some countries still have those. And so that limits the number of products that go places. And so we started to see that and as those barriers got lower and lower it got easier for other companies to jump over into other markets because hey there's nothing holding us back so that was one of the things the trade barriers really reducing and that's why you have things like nafta you have things like the european union and stuff like that which is really getting there together to help lower those trade barriers to make it easier for businesses to work in other countries now another thing that's really helped drive globalization is basically transportation has really made international trade a lot easier and much more cost effective. I mean, if I think about it in terms of study abroad, like I, I take students on study abroad trips, right? And so if we want to go from Chicago to France for a trip, it's what, a nine hour flight. We go to O'Hare, you know, two or three hours before and we check in, wait for security, fly over. Hey, we leave in the morning, we're in France the next day. Yay, it's great. I mean, it's a day to get there. If I think back to my grandma, she was also from Illinois. She went from Rock Island, Illinois and studied the Sorbonne in Paris in the 20s. It did not take her one day to get there. It did not take her two days to get there. I mean, think about it. Train from Rock Island to Chicago, another train from Chicago to probably Toledo, and then Toledo to maybe New York City. The New York City, she got on a boat and then the boat went across to, to England. She got the boat in England, then came across the channel and then took a train down to Paris and had to get there. I mean, how much longer did it take her to, to just get there? I mean, think about that with products. You're going from, well, I can be in France in a day was way better than I'll be in France in a week. And think about how that changes things. Think about foods. I mean, fruits and vegetables, they might not make it a week off the vine and now they could be there overnight. Ever wondered how you can have fresh oysters in the middle of the US? Well, yeah, transportation has made that possible. So that's good. But also how we transport our products has changed. Think about it, if you ever watch any of the old pirate movies, they always got the, the bag of cargo and the netting, right? And that's what we're taking our barrels in and stuff like that. Well, now we have these super tanker, you know, super 
super, super tanker, you know, boats and ships going that can hold thousands and millions of products. Whereas before, maybe we could only sh ship like 100 products. Think about it. If you think about the ships 500 years ago, in comparison, they're probably one one hundredth, one one thousandth of the size in terms of how much they could ship. That's going to really influence things as well. Another thing that's changed, this kind of goes along with the trade barriers, is the laws in general have become more standardized around the world. And here's one of those things. If you look at kind of standardization of laws in terms of things that I have to do to make sure my product can be sold in the country. Well, if everyone's doing the same laws, now I don't have to change my product for every single market. I can make my product once and it'll be okay in all those different markets because all of them have the same law. That makes my life a lot easier because if all of a sudden I have to change in every country where the blinker is on a car. Oh, it's got to be on the left side, the right side. No, it's got to be on the dash. Some countries, they're gonna say, look, that country's too small. I'm not gonna make a product just for them. So it kind of stopped globalization. But with everyone having the same kind of standardized laws, then it's like, hey, why not ship it there? Because if I'm shipping to this country, they have the same laws as that country, well, I might as well just ship it there too. Another thing that's really driven globalization is now we're seeing our, pro our production processes have kind of moved all over the world. So your Ford might be made in Mexico. Your, your Apple phone might be made in China. Your Nokia battery might be made in Hungary, right? Or think about it, the processes for good music. Hey, where are those good beats coming from? Remember, Korea had Sai and Despacito and all these kind of things. You have all this stuff coming from all over. And the thing is, as these processes become more integrated, people are more likely to buy products they made, right? And so if I'm in a country and I'm working in a factory and I made this product, I might buy it myself too, right? So that country will start doing it. And we're starting to integrate in all these different places. And that pro all these processes together is getting us to think about, hey, what are the other markets out there? Who else could we be selling to? And the thing is, is when we look at culture specifically and where globalization's coming from, what we start to see is the differences, the intracultural differences, like the differences within a culture are becoming less and less or within a country, but also the differences between countries are getting less and less. I mean, I travel all around the world and you know what? That Manchester United jersey, that's popular all over. That Brazilian soccer jersey, I see kids playing it around the world. And we start to see it's like, okay, so people are liking the same kind of stuff. But when we start to see the differences starting to get smaller and smaller, for example, if we look at an intracultural difference, if you're in the US, okay, and you're driving down the main shopping street, you already know what they're gonna have. There's gonna be a Starbucks, right? There's gonna be a Walmart, there's gonna be a Best Buy, there's gonna be, you know, some kind of like Home Depot or something like that, and a Target, right? It's gonna be the same thing everywhere you go. And what we've seen in the last 20, 30 years in the US, you don't have very many differences anymore. When you're driving into Cincinnati or some other medium-sized city, you're like, well, I don't know where I'm at because it all kind of seems the same. And that's the thing is we start seeing the differences getting less and less. And so if it's less differences, well, then it's easier for me to sell one kind of product versus having different products for different regions within a country. Okay, and you take that same concept and you look at it between countries. I mean, look, I get my shirts and I get my clothes in different countries, but you know what? I don't look out of place when I go places. I mean, maybe except for my belly, but you look at it like, look, H&M made it, you know, it's a Swedish company, but they sell it all over the world, right? You might be wearing some now, the university town you're at might have an H&M in their mall. And are you in Sweden? Maybe not. But the thing is, those those fashions and those styles are working everywhere. And these companies are seeing, hey, people are liking the same kind of clothes, the same kind of fits. You know, if one rock star is popular, one musician's popular, their clothing line might influence people all over the world. And so we see these kind of things. And as these differences become less and less, it just means that globalization is becoming more and more because we're becoming more and more of a homogenous group. OK, so you do see that. And so I know it's not always a, a popular topic to talk about, but I thought it was something you should know in terms of what is globalization and where are some of the, or what are some of the kind of drivers of it over the last, you know, 50, 200 years. I mean, because these things are going on for quite some time. So I hope that gives you a rough idea about some of the drivers of globalization. Okay, so like reduction in trade barriers, standardization of laws, transportation development, right? Global processes are happening. Intracultural differences, like within country differences are getting less and less. And differences between countries are getting less and less. So that was a very short version of a very long time of me talking. But if you're ever one of my students, you know exactly that's what I do in every single class. So 
now you got an idea of what my verbal diarrhea looks like. Anyway, have a great day, and I wish you good luck if you're taking an exam. If you just want to know a little bit about a globalization, I hope that helped you out. Otherwise, I wish you all the best, and if you're looking to go travel someplace, Rwanda is a fantastic country. The people are awesome. The food's awesome. The stuff you can see here, streets are clean. It's just such a wonderful, wonderful place. Anyway, wish you all the best. Bye from Rwanda. Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're gonna to talk about is the globalizations of products and services. So offshoring and offshore banking and production abroad, these kind of things. Because we look at globalization, one of the biggest things that's actually coming about is how we've kind of globalized how we make our products, how we sell our products and stuff like that. And so if we look at offshoring, it really is the globalization of products. So firms may procure goods or parts of their product products from all around the world. I mean, think about it. If you have a, a pizza made with real mozzarella cheese from Italy, well, that's global production. They start getting some of their inputs from abroad. And we do that to take advantage of some of these national differences because you know what? Italy does make some pretty dang good, you know, mozzarella cheese for your pizza. But also we might look at it in terms of how we make our products. We might see countries that have, you know, cheaper labor forces like in China and Indonesia where a lot of clothing is made and stuff like that. Or we might go to some place where there's more skilled labor we might need. Like if we're a big engineering firm or research firm, we probably want to be in the US or we want to be in Germany or Japan, someplace like that. And so we really do see companies going to different vendors around the world. So it might be producing in another country or just getting parts of their products in another country just to take advantage of all these things. So that's kind of the idea of the offshoring. It's like you, part of your production process is happening not in your local market, okay? Now on the other side of things, a lot of people don't realize there's actually also the globalization of services. We're here in Luxembourg. This is a banking capital of Europe and the world because they have advantageous banking laws. Or at least they used to. They're trying to clean it up a little bit here. And and the thing is, is you might look for, where am I gonna get the best interest rates? Where am I gonna get the best tax rates? Um, where, where are all the trained people going to be? And so we might be looking at those things. So you might see there's the offshore banking where people will go to. You notice if you're trying to get you know investments into your business for a startup, they don't stay in Lisbon, they go to San Francisco. That's where you go where their startup culture is and where the money is. And so you're seeing how you know Portuguese startups and Chinese startups and you know Indonesian startups, they end up going to San Francisco because that's where the money is. And that's what this globalization of services really comes about. We're finding better rates, we're finding better taxes, we're finding where the money is, where the you know people are. Because you know, if you think about it, it. Movies, they're a service, right? So if you want to be in the movie industry, you got to be at Hollywood and stuff like that. And the thing is, you can actually see companies that are taking advantage of this globalization of services, these different rates. If you look up your favorite tax company and their European headquarters, they might be in Ireland because there's a better tax rate and tax advantages to be there. Banks, they like to be in Luxembourg and Switzerland because the rules are a little different. So they might set their banking up in Luxembourg or Switzerland or the Cayman Islands and stuff like that. So there's all kinds of different things you might be looking at. And the thing is, is offshoring and the globalization out there is not just about production. Yes, the clothes are getting made in China and the cars might be making in different parts or you're getting different parts of your products from different places, but it's not just the production side of things. There is also the globalization of those services. Anyway, I hope this helps you better understand globalization of products and globalization of services so you have a better idea of how things are working and how it does happen because it really comes down to companies finding the most advantageous spots for them to either produce or do their business or create their services that's where they're going to go. Anyway, I wish you all the best. And if you want to learn more, why don't you hit the subscribe button and we put out other marketing and business videos to explain basic topics and more advanced topics and marketing, business, YouTube, all kinds of things. And I'll say bye from here in Luxembourg. And I hope this helped you learn a little bit. Bye. Hey there fellow marketers and marketing students, Professor Walters here and today we're here in Prague and today we're going to talk about is Porter's National Diamond Framework. Basically it's a way for business to look and see is what countries would be good for us to invest in for certain things but also why certain countries are really good at certain things like why is the Czech Republic so great at beer or why is Portugal so great at wine or why is the US so great at making movies. These kind of things, this diamond framework helps you kind of understand that so you can see hmm if I want to be a movie star, where do I need to go to? Probably need to go to Hollywood, all right? So there's kind of four criteria I'm going to talk about in this diamond. 
One is factory conditions, the kind of stuff you need in order to make something. The next one, you're looking at supporting industries, so the things that help the industry survive and thrive. Then you look at your domestic customers. Are your domestic customers you know, drive you to do better? And then you look at your domestic rivalry. Are you fighting all the time with your local competition? Does that prepare you for the outside world? These kind of things, all right? So the first thing I wanna talk about are those factor conditions. These are the things that you need to have in order to make a product, okay? So to make wine, you need to be able to have, you know, be able to grow grapes, right? So you need lots of sun, you need good soil, good climate, things like that. And if you think about about it what countries make good wine well you got Portugal Spain France Italy South Africa Australia Argentina Chile California you have all those and what do they all have they all have lots of Sun and great weather and so you have these things and then they also have good soil that can make the wine taste really good and so you have that so that's a factor condition you have to have other industries you might look at manufacturing well one of the factors conditions you need is maybe cheap labor and that's where you see china has a lot of manufacturing there because the big factor condition is i need to have cheap labor and that's one of the things that they have okay and so basically just think of the, the they have the raw materials to make things happen when you're looking at the factor conditions so the second factor you have to look at is related and supporting industries what are the kind of industries that need to be there in order to make that main industry be successful okay so Portugal very successful in wine right but also it doesn't hurt that they have a huge cork production there you know the cork for the the bottles it's actually the bark of the cork tree right well they grow those cork trees in Portugal so that helps them out think about professional sports in the US the NFL the NBA Major League Baseball wow those are really great leagues well why is that think about the supporting industries college sports high school sports i mean heck kids are playing you know football and baseball and soccer at three years old okay so we've been training them all this time so when they get to the big leagues hey that industry is gonna be a lot better because they're trained up right and if you look at in terms of the hollywood and the movie industry it doesn't hurt that a lot of the big marketing and advertising firms in the world are based in the u.s so they're helping to market those movies and stuff like that so you have those things now the third criteria we're going to look at is we're actually going to look at the strategy and structural of rivalry in the domestic market. So basically, how much are they fighting with their competition at home? I mean, think about it. If, you, if McDonald's has been fighting Hardee's and Burger King and Wendy's for what, like 70 years? So they're trained up, they know what to do. And so when they go abroad, it's a lot easier for them to be a success because they've kind of figured out what it takes to beat the competition. And I'm here in Prague and there's a McDonald's there, there's a Burger King up there, there's a Starbucks over there because they've learned in the US and they've taken what they've learned and gone everywhere else. So that rivalry has really, you know, kind of, kind of tightened them up, right? And the fourth factor is our domestic consumers. What is the demand from our domestic consumers? What do they do that drives us? Well, in the US, if you go to McDonald's and have to wait more than two minutes, you're like upset. So the customer's always like faster, faster, faster. So McDonald's gets faster, faster, faster. Burger King got faster, faster, faster because that's what their domestic consumers demand. If you look at wine in Portugal, Portugal, the, the domestic consumers, they don't have a lot of money, but they want some good wine. So if you're looking for good, affordable wine, go buy Portuguese wine. I mean, it's unbelievably tasting and unbelievably low price. Well, yeah, because their domestic consumers weren't gonna buy expensive stuff. And so the, the wineries in Portugal learned how to make good wine at an affordable price. Here in the Czech Republic, the beer is fantastic. Why is that? Because the locals won't drink crappy beer, okay? So they've driven them to make better beer, better beer. So when you go around the world and you have a Pilsner Urkel or another Czech beer, you're like, my God, this stuff is so good. Yeah, because you can thank the Czechs for that because they've demanded good beer for hundreds of years and it's developed into that, that industry, okay? So you have great beer here. So I hope this all together helps you understand more about Porter's National Diamond Framework. If you want to learn other global marketing topics and stuff like that, hit that subscribe button and we put out new marketing and travel, or no, sorry, put out new marketing and YouTube videos and training videos all the time. So we appreciate our like subscriptions. Do hit that like, that like bell, give us that thumbs up. If you do hit the subscription bell, we really appreciate it. And we wish you all a great time here in Prague and a great time learning marketing. Or if you're looking to go global, going global. Bye from Prague. 
Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Luxembourg, one of the banking capitals of the world. And today we're gonna to talk about are some of the ways that companies assess global markets for possible entry, like how to decide where we should invest. Should we come to Luxembourg or should we go to Belgium or should we go to Liechtenstein or should we go to LA? We have to kind of figure out what's gonna work. And so we're gonna talk about in this video are just kind of the four basic ways that companies evaluate different markets. Now there's a lot of ways you're gonna do it, but these are kind of the four basic overall always one you're gonna do what's called an economic analysis right you're gonna see how is the business set up there you know what, what's the GDP like what's the, the average income that's going on there purchasing power parity what what's the money worth there when you are there you've got to look at these kind of things okay but also you also have to look at the social cultural aspects how do I manage my people what are some of those cultural nuances that are different how how is it that they look at risk and stuff like that so we're gonna look at the culture as well another thing we're gonna look at is the infrastructure and the technology that's there. How's the, the supply chain system work there? How's the retail system there? What are the roads like? Is there a train system to ship our products? These kind of things. And then we're gonna do a legal political analysis of what's going on. You know, how is, is the government in this other country gonna help us or hinder us? Is there you know import taxes we're gonna to have to worry about, you know, tariffs we have to worry about, our quotas, these kind of things. And the thing is, we have videos on talking about infrastructure and technology. We also have a video analyzing the social cultural aspects of assessing a market. And and also we have one looking at the legal political side of things. So in this video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the economic side of it, because this is gonna be really the biggest impact one that you're gonna look at, because in general, the more robust the economy is that you're gonna go into, the better chance a new product, a new business is gonna succeed there, just because people have more disposable income in order to, to spend in that market, okay? Because if you think about it, the more money you have to spend, the more likely you're gonna try something new. The less money you have, you're more selective where you put it. So we have to think about those things. And so what we'll look at is one thing we'll look at is kind of the general overall economic situation in the market we're going to go to so are they in a recession are they in a boom economy how is the market growing or is it shrinking we have to think about those things because if it's in a recession probably not a good time to go if it's booming and people are spending more money hey that might be a good chance for us to enter because we can kind of ride the wave with all this growth because no matter what when you're evaluating the overall economic situation you want to make sure the economic situation the market you're going to is going to help you succeed seed in that market okay so if it is maybe go for it if it's not or it makes you go oh maybe i should wait a bit maybe you hold off on entering into that market okay so you want to think about that and some of the metrics you might look at in terms of deciding whether to export to a country or maybe like make your manufacturing in that country might be looking at their trade surplus versus their trade deficit because they have a trade surplus they're sending out more stuff than they're taking in which might mean hmm they must have some kind of tricks of the trade so we could use their trade surplus to our advantage advantage and manufacture there and use their bonuses and their their knowledge to help our products get out quicker get out cheaper get sent around the world more other things you might look at the GDP you know the gross domestic product or the gross national income these kind of like how wealthy a country is that could be a helpful thing to indicate as well depending on the kind of products we're serving and we're selling other things you might look at we might look at though just the overall size of the market there's a reason why companies fall all over themselves to go to China it's a huge market at 1.5 billion people maybe using my products yes I'm I'm going to try to go there. Luxembourg, there's like 600,000 people. Not a lot of people are falling all over themselves to come here because there's not a lot of people. There's not a lot of potential customers. So we're going to look at that. Now, aside from the actual just overall size of the market, you might look at actually the growth rate of the market. How much bigger is it going to get or how much is it growing? So if you look at here in Europe, they're not having a lot of kids, but there are a lot of people that are getting to retirement age. And so the growth in the European market or the housing market might be in retirement communities. So if I'm in the retirement community, you know, building company kind of industry well this might be a place i'd want to invest in so we might look at that another thing we might look at is actually purchasing power parity so basically how far does their money go like what is cheap what is expensive based on what they make because in some countries yeah mcdonald's is super cheap but in other places that might be the exact same dollar amount for that big mac but it's a lot more expensive for them because their money doesn't go as far and the thing is there's tons of different economic indicators and metrics you might want to use to analyze another market and so you got to think about those 
those things out there, okay? Because the economic situation really has probably the biggest impact on if your new market's really worth going into or not. So if you wanna learn more, you wanna learn about the political side of things, the social, cultural, infrastructure, and technology kind of ways to assess, we have other videos for that as well. They're down in the, the, the information down below. Just look down there and there's links to those there is to help you out. Anyway, I hope this helps you know a little bit more about how companies actually assess global markets. If you wanna learn more, check us out on our website or go check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Professor Walters to learn more. Bye from Luxembourg. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Luxembourg, one of the banking capitals of the world. And today we're gonna to talk about are some of the ways that companies assess global markets for possible entry, like how to decide where we should invest. Should we come to Luxembourg or should we go to Belgium or should we go to Liechtenstein or should we go to LA? We have to kind of figure out what's gonna work. And so we're gonna talk about in this video are just kind of the four basic ways that companies evaluate different markets. Now there's a lot of ways you're gonna do it, but these are kind of the four basic overall always one you're gonna do what's called an economic analysis right you're gonna see how is the business set up there you know what, what's the GDP like what's the, the average income that's going on there purchasing power parity what what's the money worth there when you are there you've got to look at these kind of things okay but also you also have to look at the social cultural aspects how do I manage my people what are some of those cultural nuances that are different how how is it that they look at risk and stuff like that so we're gonna look at the culture as well another thing we're gonna look at is the infrastructure and the technology that's there. How's the, the supply chain system work there? How's the retail system there? What are the roads like? Is there a train system to ship our products? These kind of things. And then we're gonna do a legal political analysis of what's going on. You know, how is, is the government in this other country gonna help us or hinder us? Is there you know import taxes we're gonna to have to worry about, you know, tariffs we have to worry about, our quotas, these kind of things. And the thing is, we have videos on talking about infrastructure and technology. We also have a video analyzing the social cultural aspects of assessing a market. And also we have one looking at the legal political side of things. So in this video, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the economic side of it, because this is gonna be really the biggest impact one that you're gonna look at, because in general, the more robust the economy is that you're gonna go into, the better chance a new product, a new business is gonna succeed there, just because people have more disposable income in order to, to spend in that market, okay? Because if you think about it, the more money you have to spend, the more likely you're gonna try something new. The less money you have, you're more selective where you put it. So we have to think about those things. And so what we'll look at is one thing we'll look at is kind of the general overall economic situation in the market we're going to go to so are they in a recession are they in a boom economy how is the market growing or is it shrinking we have to think about those things because if it's in a recession probably not a good time to go if it's booming and people are spending more money hey that might be a good chance for us to enter because we can kind of ride the wave with all this growth because no matter what when you're evaluating the overall economic situation you want to make sure the economic situation the market you're going to is going to help you succeed in that market okay so if it is maybe go for it if it's not or it makes you go oh maybe i should wait a bit maybe you hold off on entering into that market okay so you want to think about that and some of the metrics you might look at in terms of deciding whether to export to a country or maybe like make your manufacturing in that country might be looking at their trade surplus versus their trade deficit because they have a trade surplus they're sending out more stuff than they're taking in which might mean hmm they must have some kind of tricks of the trade so we could use their trade surplus to our advantage and manufacture there and use their bonuses and their their knowledge to help our products get out quicker get out cheaper get sent around the world more other things you might look at the GDP you know the gross domestic product or the gross national income these kind of like how wealthy a country is that could be a helpful thing to indicate as well depending on the kind of products we're serving and we're selling other things you might look at we might look at though just the overall size of the market there's a reason why companies fall all over themselves to go to China it's a huge market 1.5 billion people maybe use my products yes I'm going to try to go there Luxembourg there's like 600,000 people not a lot of people are falling all over themselves to come here because there's not a lot of people there's not a lot of potential customers so we're going to look at that now aside from the actual just overall size of market you might look at actually the growth rate of the market how much bigger is it going to get or how much is it growing so if you look at here in Europe they're not having a lot of kids but there are a lot of people that are getting to retirement age and so the growth in the European market or the housing market might be in retirement communities so if I'm in the retirement community you know 
building company kind of industry, well, this might be a place I'd want to invest in. So we might look at that. Another thing we might look at is actually purchasing power parity. So basically, how far does their money go? Like what is cheap? What is expensive based on what they make? Because in some countries, yeah, McDonald's is super cheap. But in other places that might be the exact same dollar amount for that Big Mac, but it's a lot more expensive for them because their money doesn't go as far. And the thing is, there's tons of different economic indicators and metrics you might want to use to analyze another market. And so you got to think about those things out there okay because the economic situation really has probably the biggest impact on if your new market's really worth going into or not so if you want to learn more you want to learn about the political side of things the social cultural infrastructure and technology kind of ways to assess we have other videos for that as well they're down in the the, the information down below just look down there and there's links to those there is to help you out anyway i hope this helps you know a little bit more about how companies actually assess global markets if you want to learn more check us out on our website or go check out our youtube channel youtube.com slash professor walters to learn more. Bye from Luxembourg. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here and today we are here in Vienna, Austria. And today we want to talk about one of the things that companies do and firms do in order to analyze kind of the, the desirability of going to certain international markets. So how do we kind of evaluate markets? Now we have a video on looking at the social cultural stuff. We have a video on economics. We have a video on, on other things. But what we need to look at today is actually the legal political kind of stuff that might influence us if we're going to be going into a new market, okay? Or maybe if we're going to do business with certain countries and things like that. Now, what I want to talk about are a few kind of things that governments do do that do influence business in terms of international business. And one of the things is they might be limiting the flow of goods to a country. And that could be one, they could have a quota. And what a quota does, it sets a limit on the total number of products that can be brought in from a certain country. Usually it's probably a certain kind of product. So they might say, you know, only 50,000 Toyotas are allowed to come into Austria. I mean, that's a lot of, uh, a lot of cars that come here, but they're making a limit, only 50,000. Now the thing is, that hurts domestic consumers, because imagine if you're the 50,000 and first person in Austria that wants to buy a, a Toyota, you're kind of out of luck, okay? Now on the other side of it, it actually helps the domestic producers because the domestic producers in the European Union that are making cars, haha, now that 50,000 at first person has to buy one of our Skodas or our Volkswagens or something like that. So you have those things. But a quota, at least you get to bring something in. Sometimes countries have what are called boycotts where they will allow no products from that country, okay? So like in the US, you might have a boycott on North Korean goods or Iranian goods or sometimes Cuban goods and things like that. And if somebody wants to get a Cuban cigar and you're in the US, too bad, it's totally a boycott. So of course the domestic consumer is the one that's missing out. Now, if you're gonna be buying like cigars made in the US, good for you. Hey, that domestic producer, hey, we're getting all that desired demand. They wanna buy the Cuban cigars, they can't, they gotta buy from us. So that's a thing there, okay? So remember, quota, set limit, you know, of a certain number and boycott is completely nothing's there. Now, another thing you probably hear a lot about in the news are tariffs. And what a tariff is, is when a government imposes a tax on a product coming into the country, okay? So if I'm trying to bring in, let's say, wool from Britain, okay? Let's say it costs $10 for that wool in Britain, but the thing is, I'm putting a 20% tax on that. Well, now that wool, when it comes and, and the people in the U.S. want to buy it, well, instead of it being $10, it's going to be $12 because they put a 20% tariff on there. So it makes everything more expensive. And the thing is, a lot of times governments will say is we'll put those tariffs to show those other governments that, that they should do stuff. Well, the thing is, is, is that other government paying the tax and the tariff? No, they're not. It's the domestic consumer that has to pay the higher price. So they're losing out because they got to spend more money because you know what? I want to have my soccer tour from here in Austria. I don't want it from the US. I want it to be shipped there. And so I'm kind of missing out on that. Or I want that, that, I want that British wool from Scotland. I want that. And so I'm going to willing to pay more for it. Now, for domestic producers in the US, if we look at the wool thing, hey, it's good for them because if we were, you know, think about it, if we were $10 wool versus $10 wool and someone wanted Scottish wool, so they can say, oh, I have Scottish wool on. Well, now all of a sudden it was equal. So hey, they'd buy the Scottish wool, but now it's 20% more expensive. Now that domestic produced wool looks more affordable and people buy that more. So it actually helps the domestic producer. But again, the domestic consumer is the one that loses out. Now the thing is, not all government action is actually bad for the domestic consumers. These are just few, first few ones I was kind of talking about. 
There's another thing you might see, what we call trade agreements. You might agree with things like NAFTA, or North American Free Trade Agreements, where it's free trade of goods between Canada, Mexico, and the U.S., and so we can get goods and services going around. The European Union, where you know you can be born in Portugal and work in Germany and then retire in Spain. You can move all over, but also you can move your money all over. You can compare prices in different places buy there and stuff like that. So it makes it really easy for me, people to go places, businesses to work in multiple locations. Cause hey, we make it so there's no extra tariffs, no extra problems. It's good for our domestic consumers because now think about it. If I'm here in Austria, now I can get all those tasty Italian pastas here. I can get those German sausages. I can get those Finnish sweets that come down that are so good. I can have those in and there's no tariffs, there's no limits, nothing like that because we have that trade agreement. And then you'll have what are called exchange controls. And so what exchange controls do is they might limit the amount of financial like money flowing from different between countries. So sometimes what you might see is a currency control. Some countries don't let you take money out of their country. Well, if I can't take my money or my profits out of the country, why am I going to invest more there? I might not do that. So that kind of turns people off. And so sometimes what companies do is they work with what are called transfer pricing. So let's say I'm a company and I can't get my money out of this country, so I'll hire one of my consultants from my firm back in their U.S. branch. Have them come to Austria and then I'll charge you know, $100,000 for their services because the people are doing work for us and then that money can flow back to our country that way. But taking the actual profits out, sometimes exchanging controls kind of eliminate that. So it makes it a little bit more difficult to get it out there. Um, also, sometimes it might be a limit about how much money people can exchange. I know, think about it, your local bank, when you take money out of the ATM, might put a limit, only $500 a day or 500 euros a day. Well, what if you want to spend more money? You can't, you're limited at what you can do. Now imagine that for a big company, it can really limit what they can do. And so what they might end up doing is deciding, you know what, I'm not going to work in that market because it's not worth it because all of the exchange controls and issues like that, and that could be some things. And also sometimes government actions might mean that you have to work with other companies, so you might be forced into doing a, a joint venture. And if I have intellectual property I don't want to lose, do I want to have to work with somebody else and they might steal my ideas? And there's all kinds of things you have to think about in terms of government regulation and all this kind of stuff, which will affect you when you're analyzing an international market to decide if that's a place that you want to go. Okay. Now we have a lot more information on here going over the economic side of things, the social cultural side of things all on our website. Also, you can check it out here on our YouTube channel, Professor Walters. Just search for the marketing bar and you'll find all kinds of the marketing playlist. You'll find all kinds of marketing videos to help you out. We've also got videos on YouTube stuff, how to teach, all kinds of good fun business things. So do check it out. We do appreciate your likes and subscriptions. Sorry for the wind and the rain, but I'm here wandering through Vienna and I thought this would be a good place to talk about international trade because this was the hub of international trade back in the day. Anyway, I'll say bye from Vienna. Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Budapest, Hungary, and today what we're going to talk about is actually how you analyze transportation and infrastructure in a different country to see if it's going to be a good place for your business to work. Because no matter where we're going to go in the world, we've got to analyze things. We might look at the economic side of things, the cultural side of things, the legal sides of things, but of course you got to look at transportation, you got to look at infrastructure, you got to look at communication, right? And so that's what this video is going to focus on. It's going to focus on how do we analyze the infrastructure and transportation networks of countries we might want to go work in, okay? Now, the first thing I want to talk about is actually the transportation network. I mean, think about it. The roads, the railways, the airports, the ports, the train lines, stuff like that. What do they have? How will I be able to get my product from in the country to other parts of the country? Because that will have a really big effect. I mean, think about it. If you're in the US, you have this huge country. How do we get it across? Well, there are rail lines we could use. We could fly stuff across the country, like a FedEx thing. We could put it on trucks that go on the highway. We have all these things. But imagine if you're going to a country where maybe they don't have highways. Maybe it's more the back roads, windy roads kind of things, or dirt road kind of things. Well, that's going to influence the kind of transportation you use. Because in the U.S., I can have a big, huge truck going down the road. That big semi pulls into Walmart, no problem. But if I'm here in Budapest, you can't drive the uh, big semis through here and deliver stuff. you got to have smaller trucks. So I have smaller trucks to transport on those smaller roads. That means, okay, I have to make more trips. I have to have more people. I'm going to have to have, uh, you know, more of a logistics network is going to be more important to me. So you have things like that. And also, if you're going to have your workers, I mean, think about it. That tram going by right there, <laughs> it's a cool tram. And the thing is, how do my workers get to work? Is it going to be easy for them? And well, they can take the public transport there. 
that's going to be great. I don't have to give them a special, you know, parking budget. I can just give them a monthly pass on the on the tram. And you have to think about these things because also with transportations and transfer transporting your goods, you got to think about is how will my goods get there? Because sometimes you can't use a truck. Sometimes there are no railroads and you might need to build your own transportation network. So this could be you build your own pipeline to get the oil from the center of the country to the port. Or like if you're in Sao Paulo, you build a pipeline that pumps orange juice concentrate from the interior of the Sao Paulo state to the Port of Santos so you can get it out there because the roads in Brazil are crazy. You'd sit in a traffic jam forever. So you gotta think about that, okay? So that's one thing. But it's not just the roads you have to think about. You also have to think about your distribution network you're gonna have in that country. So think about it. If you wanna be in a lot of grocery stores in the US, hey, I just gotta get with Walmart and I'll be almost everywhere, it's great. Well, the thing is, in some countries, you don't have one big player that goes everywhere. You might have a ton of little stores you have to go to, and how will that affect your distribution? Man, now I gotta go see so many people versus one delivery, I've got 10 kind of stuff. Because we have to figure out is what, what's one of our key things, and if one of your kind of key success factors, one of your core capabilities is distribution, you gotta figure out is, hey, how can I distribute my products the best way possible? I remember, it was my 22nd birthday, I mean, so it's been a few years ago, and I was hiking the Inca Trail in Peru. I gave this highest peak there, and I'm like, oh, I is so, just so high up here, I can't breathe anymore, but it's so beautiful. And there's an old lady there with a bucket of water, and in the water, there's bottles of Coca-Cola. I'm like, oh my God, that is distribution. Like, how did Coke get a lady that would have, the, have you know, Cokes there at the top of a mountain? That's insane. And so you have to think about that. How am I gonna get that distribution going? How am I gonna set up that network? These are really important things you have to think about. And then you gotta think about your communications network, okay? I mean, I know now we're like, well, everywhere I go, I have my Wi-Fi. Well, no, not everywhere you go, you have Wi-Fi. Not everywhere you go, you get 5G or 4G or whatever, LTE connection. You have to look at these things. Do they have the systems we can do? I mean, if they've got Google, you know, Google, you know, stuff there that makes it super fast internet, great. But what if it's still dial-up? What if they don't have smartphones? What if it's still the old flip phones? And so, for example, a bank. Think about it. with your bank, they do different things for you, right? And they're communicating with you in different ways. Maybe they'll have their, their website that you can go online on your computer for, or you can use your smartphone and use that 5G or 4G technology to you know fastly check your bank and, and make trades and all kinds of stuff. But then other times, maybe you just send them a text message, balance, send B-A-L to this number, and we'll send you your bank balance. Well, those are three different ways that they're communicating with you. And some of those, some places in the world don't have all of those. Just think about it. If you don't have the, the high speed data or people don't use smartphones, well, then most likely we're going to use the text messaging banking. Our, our, our having a cool smartphone app is probably not going to help if nobody has a smartphone. So we have to think about that in the communication style. Because I know a lot of people think Wi-Fi is a God-given right and I should have it everywhere. Well, businesses know it's not a God-given right and a lot of places you can't get it. So you got to be careful with that. And another infrastructure thing I want to talk about, and there's more, but I just want to finish off with this one, is we have to look at is how does business work? Okay, like how do you pay? I mean, do you pay like in Brazil where you can pay in 12 installments? Or is it you pay after 30 days or 90 days? Or is it cash only or can I pay with credit card? I mean, I'm here in Budapest, and some places they'll say, look, we'll take euros, we'll take foreigns, we'll take credit cards, whatever you want. Other places, like, no, cash only, and only foreigns, the local currency here. And that'll affect where you go, because think about it. If, I, if there's no ATM around for me to get cash, well, then I can only go to a restaurant that takes credit card, right? And so that's going to limit what I can do. And so for companies, they need to know is, how do people usually pay here? What's something here? Are they using Apple Pay all the time? Then I need to have that. If nobody's using Apple Pay, then maybe I just do cash only. And so you have to think about those things and the ramifications for it. Because all of a sudden we're doing all cash stuff. Well, then what about safety, security of the money and things like that? Then there's all kinds of other stuff you have to think about. Also, you can think about some of the like more seedier sides of things. Like what if it was a country where bribing is quite common? If it is, uh-oh, we could get in trouble for that. But what do we do if we don't? And that's why it's really important for companies when they're evaluating new markets to go into, it's not just looking that we're gonna make money there, and it's not just looking to see if like the people will work out, it's looking at the basic infrastructure of the company with transportation and money and stuff like that to see if we can actually work there. So I hope this helps you know a little bit more about what you need to do to evaluate a market to go into. If you wanna learn more, we've got videos on the social side of things, we've got videos on the economic side of things, we've got videos on the legal side of things. 
And do check those out here on our channel. If you do like marketing videos like this, do hit that subscribe button and you'll get all our new marketing videos popping up all over. Well, if you hit the bell, you subscribe is nice, but hit the bell, then you definitely will get all of our videos. And a big thank you to all of you that have watched. I really appreciate it. If you wanna give us a thumbs up, we appreciate that too. And we'll say bye from Budapest. Hi guys, Mark here with Walter's World and we're in Beijing, China in the Black Bamboo Park. A really great place to kind of chill out and get to see some Chinese culture, people doing Tai Chi, you know, meeting people, fun stuff like that. Getting to know about a new culture for me. And one of the things for companies need to know is how do we kind of gauge different cultures we go to, different countries we go to. And what happened was they came up, Garrett Hofstede came up with a kind of a model of different criteria of, of cultures. So you can see, well, what do we need to do? How can I introduce new products there? Or, you know, how do I manage? my people when I'm there and so he went out around to a bunch of IBM places all around the world and did a bunch of surveys and he came up with all these ideas and all these things and he broke it down into four main parts now it's been expanded to five maybe even six but I'm going to talk about the main four and then one extra one so let's get started the first dimension of culture that he talks about is power distance basically you have a high power distance or low power distance and this is how people kind of deal with inequality in terms of is the boss a god or is the boss your friend so example, in the US, we're friends with our boss, we go have dinner with our boss, hang out with them, we can joke with them, things like that. So other countries, look like at Venezuela, where there's a very high power distance, your boss is more, your boss says do it, you say yes sir, and there's not much discussion with it. So you, you expect to be told what to do. Now if you're going to a high power distance country to, to do work, you need to realize that you can't be buddy-buddy. You can try, but people don't accept it as much. So you want to make sure you do have kind of that kind of level between people. Okay. If you're going to a low power distance country, realize that it's going to be a lot more friend stuff and you can't dictate to people as much as you do in a high power distance one. Okay. Now, number two on our, the second uh, kind of dimension of culture they talk about is uncertainty avoidance. And this is how cultures look at risk. How much risk are they willing to accept? So low uncertainty avoidance means, hey, I'm cool with risk. So if you're going to come out with a new product, they're more likely to accept it because, hey, trying a new product is spending money and that's risky. Okay, so low power distance, more accepting of new products. If you look at a high power distance one, they don't like risk, it's going to have a different thing. So, hey, I don't want anything unknown. So the legal system will have lots of rules put in there to make sure every single situation is taken care of. Okay, it's going to be, if you're going to be selling a new product, you know, you got to really explain what the benefits are, why they should buy it, how they use it, and things like that. So people don't feel like, uh oh, I'm not sure if I'm going to take this risk of a new product. The third one. The third dimension of culture is individualism versus collectivism. This is kind of like how people see themselves in relation to the group. So in an individualistic society or individualism, people like me, 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 me first, I think about me and that's it. In more collectivist societies, you have more of a, a group mentality, thinking about the group more we, we, we. So for example, in the US, it's very much a me first society. So what do you do with the commercials? It shows how you will have more fun, how you will be the cool guy, how you, 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 okay? You're the most important thing that individual can Consumer. Whereas you go to more collectivist society, then advertising changes more to the family. Uh, we deal, yeah, you know, we want to make everybody happy in our group and these kind of things. And if you're dealing with people, it's going to be different. Some place you got a pat on the back. Other countries you go to say, hey, the group did a good job. Even if it was one person did a good job, the whole group did a good job. Okay. Now. The fourth um, dimension of culture is masculinity versus femininity. And this is basically, well, one of the ways you can look at it is your gender roles in society, but also kind of, I mean, it sounds very sexist how they describe it. Basically, you're looking at <coughs> I mean, feminine equality and traditional feminine values versus traditional masculine values, like power first is masculine and getting along is, is feminine, but that's the way they, they decide it. And one of the ways that you also look at it in terms of you know, equality among people um, and the sexes. So like Sweden, I mean, men, women, the prime minister or they're, you know, we're working together. Everyone's the same level. Everyone has the same kind of place. So it's a, a feminine society. So there's more equality in the workplace, more let's get along, stuff like this. Whereas you have a more like kill, 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 you know, mentality. It's more of a masculine society. So a male dominated society. And it's going to be, it's going to be an issue because you're going to countries that, you know, different sexes are viewed in different ways, it will be hard to do things. And I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying you have to know it as a company how to deal with these things. Now, so those are the four main ones, the traditional ones. So you have, you know, power distance, uncertainty avoidance, individualism versus collectivism, and masculine versus feminine societies. Now those are four main ones. Then there's a fifth one that's been come up, it's called time orientation. How is the culture look? Is it short-term stuff? Like, 
let's do it now, instant gratification, or is it more long-term? I realize I have to build things up. And you can see that in country. Like in the U.S., it's a very short-term thing. So everyone's looking for now, now. I want my payoff now, okay? I want to get paid now. I need that pat on the back today, okay? Whereas more long-term societies, they may look at it and say, hey, you know, I'm using this as a building block. Yeah, $50,000 a year to go to school. Yeah, it's expensive now, but I know long-term, it's going to pay off for me, okay? So that's the fifth one and like an extra one for the Hofstede model. Now, I hope this helps you understand a little bit better how you can kind of gauge different cultures and stuff like that. Now, it doesn't always hold true with everyone. I'll tell you that right now from all my travels. Not every country fits in. Every person fits in to this model how it's supposed to. They're kind of like overall stereotypes, which are bad, but it gives you a rough idea for business, which you need to know. Okay, so I hope this helps. Um, if you want to learn more about visiting China or business stuff, check us out our website at waltersworld.com. And also, we like all of our likes and we appreciate all of our subscriptions. So, bye from Beijing, China. Hello marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here outside the Volcano National Park here in Rwanda. Actually, if you look over my right shoulder, you might see the volcanoes, one of them peeking through the clouds. It is gorgeous here. And as I've been here in Rwanda, I've seen Coke and I've seen Pepsi and I've seen, you know, Skull beer, a Brazilian beer. I've seen Jeeps and stuff like that. I've seen products from all over the world here in Rwanda that aren't necessarily made here. And it got me thinking, hey, how is it that companies decide how they should go abroad? Like, what is their global market entry strategy? Like, do, do we export our products, just make it at home and send it there? Or, or do I franchise it out or lease it? Or do we set up a joint venture together? Or, or do I direct invest and put all my money in one spot and take care of all the control it really got me thinking seeing all these things and so today what this video is about is some of the more common ways that companies do go global okay how do I get my products in a foreign market and a lot of that will depend on how much control companies want to have right I mean if you're a tech company or a pharmaceutical company you want to have all the control possible because you don't want to lose your secrets right versus the amount of risk they're willing to take so the more you're investing in that other country, the more money you're spending, right? The more risk you're taking on, okay? So these two kind of facets are really important when you're looking to go abroad, all right? So what we're gonna go through is we're gonna go through five or six different market entry strategies, well, global market entry strategies in this video to give you an idea of some of the advantages and disadvantages of each one and see how certain companies use them to their advantage. Because sometimes just exporting your product is fine. Other times I need to have my boots on the ground, I need to have my own stuff there, my own people there and companies have to make those decisions now the first way that most companies go abroad and probably the most popular way companies go abroad definitely usually the first way they go abroad is exporting that's when you use your current production facilities in your home market and you make your product there and then you just ship it to another country so jeep they might be making their products in the u.s and then they ship their jeeps here to rwanda so when we go on our cool jeep tours here and our open top safari things we can have a great time here but they're not making it here they're just exporting it to here in rwanda now the advantages of actually Actually exporting one thing is you already have the production facilities so you don't have to spend any money on that so that makes it lower risk is lower money therefore we already have our, our learning curves we've already learned all these things there also what's cool about exporting is what's the worst case scenario with our exports if it's on a ship and the ship sinks we're only out the money of the Jeeps that sank with the ship, right? So there's no other kind of risk involved. That's why this is the least amount of risk. This is why a lot of companies do it at first. Like I just want to test out globally. So I'll just send some of my products over to that country. Okay. So you have that. Now, the thing is, since a lot of companies start off with this, you're like, well, why do they stop? Well, there are some disadvantages to it. I mean, think about it. One thing is if I'm just shipping it to that market, I'm shipping a hundred Jeeps to Rwanda. What happens if tourism just booms here in Rwanda as it should, because this place is awesome and they needed 200 Jeeps. Well, we can't make any more money. Our return on investment's limited to what we sent over there. I can't take advantage of when my, my product gets popular or anything like that, because it's limited. Also, it's a little more difficult for me to earn scale economies when I'm exporting, because I'm exporting such small amounts to these countries, you know, because I'm not sure if it's gonna work, so that might limit some of the things there. You're also, you're not learning about that market, so you might be missing out. Like, I didn't know, oh, here in Rwanda, you usually wanna have an eight seat Jeep because you have groups that like to go on a travel and it becomes more cost-effective for the tour guide. 
Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, because you're not in the market. You're just exporting your product there. That's why when you're exporting, it's always important that you have a good distributor in that foreign market so you can learn from them. They're sharing information with you, okay? Now, the thing is though, like I said, this one, you have the least control over your, over your product because once you ship it, it's done. It's in their hands. I can't do anything. But what's cool is my financial risk is actually the least as well. So that's why a lot of companies kind of do this. Now, sometimes though, you want to make sure you're controlling a little bit more. Like I don't want to take on a ton of risk, but I do want to have some more control. Like I want to make sure my brand isn't ruined when it goes abroad. And so what will happen is some companies will do what's called a franchising agreement or a leasing, leasing agreement or a licensing agreement. For example, last night I was here in my, my, my hotel here in Rwanda and I'm drinking Skull beer. Skull is a Brazilian beer. And what they did is they licensed it to a brewery here in Rwanda. So they're brewing it here, okay? Another one you might see is McDonald's. McDonald's has franchisees all over the world. McDonald's doesn't own every single McDonald's. That would be too expensive. They have people that invest and, and, and buy a franchise and they set up a franchise agreement and they do it for them, okay? So what's cool about this franchise agreement is, hey, look, if I'm a comp if I'm an investor, if I'm a franchisee, okay, I'm, I'm going to buy McDonald's. I get all McDonald's secrets. I get to go to Hamburger U and learn how to make burgers and, and run my stores and all this kind of stuff. And it's really kind of cool because you're sharing all this information. Also, I'm helping them set up organizational structure, marketing structure, all these kind of things. So the brand can actually work the same way in all these different countries where people don't realize is McDonald's Germany and McDonald's, you know, US, McDonald's China are all different companies, but they're all kind of doing the same thing. So we're all kind of working together. Also, what helps these franchise agreement is since those franchisees, the ones that are buying a McDonald's franchise, they're investing in. So for McDonald's, it's really cool because, hey, we get money from them. Also, those franchisees, most likely they know that market better, right? They know what's going on there. So they know that, hey, McDonald's will probably work here. Skull Beer will probably sell here. And so you get their kind of knowledge, which is really cool. Also, they're taking on a lot of the risk. So you, you, you have a little more risk now because you're, you're doing a little bit of stuff. But, hey, it, it, it's still pretty low on the risk scale and we're looking at global expansion, right? But the thing is, is franchise agreements and franchising isn't always, you know, the best thing. You know, there are some disadvantages to it. One thing is you're limited on your control. You can only tell them to do what's in the franchise agreement, because if you try to tell them to do something that's not in the franchise agreement, they're like, hey, sorry, we don't have to ca carry your fish nuggets because it doesn't say in the franchise agreement we have to carry fish nuggets. OK, so that's why it's really important. You have a really good franchise agreement that covers different stuff from like it McDonald's probably has it where it talks about the food they have to have, how they advertise, probably um, how clean the bathrooms are, these kind of things all go into that, all right? Also a disadvantage, you're only limited to a certain percentage of the income. So let's say McDonald's China just gets huge, it gets bigger than McDonald's America, but McDonald's Corporation is only limited to that, what, 10% or something like that, that they get from the revenue. So man, we, we could be making so much more money, but again, we're limited to what the contract says. And another issue that you might see, it doesn't happen a lot of times, but it can happen is actually by having this franchisee, they could actually develop in that market and become bigger and more powerful than you. So you could actually develop your own competition. So, so that could be a thing. Now, sometimes companies also want to go a little bit farther. Okay. Now I want to, I want to put a little bit more risk out there. I'm really, really invest a little bit more money because I want to have a little bit more control, a little bit more say in what's going on. And the next step up on the scale here is what we call a strategic alliance. This is when two companies agree to work together. Two organizations agree to work together. Now, they're not investing in each other. They're not making a new company, but they're kind of like we're agreeing to work with each other. It's kind of like, hey, we're boyfriend and girlfriend, right? Now, you keep your apartment. I have my apartment, but we agree that we're dating, right? So it's kind of like that kind of feel. And I see this a lot in study abroad programs between universities. So my university and, and the v University in Vienna, they have a strategic alliance. We'll send our students to you and you send our students to us and we'll work together. Now, what's good about these things is one, Hey, I'm, I'm getting to learn from that local market. They're teaching us about Vienna, but also we're teaching them about the U.S. when they're when they're studying there. And, and we're really helping each other's business, which is a really nice thing. Now, the disadvantage is this. I mean, think about it. Have you ever dated someone and, and they do things that you don't want them to do? Well, yeah, you have no contract to stop them from doing anything. It's just that we're 
promising to work together. I didn't write it down, we're just promising to work together. And with all that information sharing, which is a good thing, sometimes you might lose some of your intellectual property, so that could be a problem with Strategic Alliance. Also, if you're helping out a lot with the Strategic Alliance, sometimes you might be also creating a competitor. And you know how things are in any friendship. A lot of times some person's giving more and other people are taking more and things like that. So you have those issues with any kind of alliance. So you had to think about those things. And so in order to kind of control better, what a lot of companies end up doing is what's called a joint venture. So joint venture, we're getting a bit more control and we're also taking on a bit more risk. And in a joint venture, the two companies, instead of just agreeing to work together, we actually financially come together. Okay, well, we maybe we set up a partnership working together, a joint venture where we're both investing our money and it's all of a sudden now things get more real. Now we're contractually linked together. It's the change from being boyfriend, girlfriend to being, you know, spouses, right? And so you have those kind of things. Like that's the next level. Like putting the ring on it, that's next level kind of stuff, right? So that's a joint venture. As your parents might say, uh, we combined our CD collection, all right? So this is like you're, you're, you're getting married, you're in married, you're living together. I mean, it's a lot more of a commitment this way, all right? And so what's cool is you're still splitting the risk and you know you try to make it a 50-50 joint venture. So we're splitting the risk e equally, the financial risk and stuff like that. We're splitting the control. We're gaining those local insights from our joint venture partner. And it really shows that we're committed to each other to work together. And another thing I should add in here though, with joint ventures is some countries actually require you to do a joint venture, depending on maybe the industry you're in or the country you're going to, these kind of things, it might be required that way. Now, some of the disadvantages of those joint ventures, which you have to realize in any joint venture, it, you know, you try to make it a 50-50 split, but a lot of times you'll see is one partner will dominate the other partner. So that can be an issue there. Also, you could be losing your intellectual property because you're sharing your stuff with them. You could also eventually be creating a competitor because they're sharing so much stuff with them. So there are issues when it comes to joint ventures. That's why some companies just say, you know what? I will take all the risk because I need to have 100% control. I mean, think about it. If you have intellectual property that you cannot share, I mean, I have figured out the best algorithm ever. I've filled out, figured out the cure for cancer or something like that. I don't want any other companies knowing this. I don't want to share this information. I want to control it all myself. Well, then you know what? Maybe direct investment is going to be the best thing for you because that way you have 100% control in the new market. But with 100% control, you have 100% of the risk. You have so much more money laid out that could just collapse and be lost, okay? Because think about it, building up that supply chain network, building up the factories, building up the, the distribution networks, all this kind of stuff costs a lot more than just putting some cars on a ship and sending it abroad, okay? So you have that. But the thing that's cool is you really do maintain control of your intellectual property. That's the key thing. Also, you get to learn about that country you're in. You're learning yourself. You're getting all those learning curve effects. You can get your economies of scale in that market. So you're becoming a big part of that market. Also, it shows a commitment to the market because, hey, if they if that country sees that you're investing big money in there and you're gonna be getting jobs in there, they might be it might be more advantageous for your business in that country. But the thing is, it's not all perfect here because remember, this is one of the disadvantages is really that this is the highest financial outlay, which means this is the highest risk way of going abroad. So you gotta be careful with that. And the thing is, just because you go abroad doesn't mean you understand the market. So you're going to have to do a lot more research. You have to have a lot more time, like making sure, is this the right place for us to be? Where do we put our store? Where do we, how do we set up our distribution? Who are the important people we have to hire? And so there's a lot more mistakes that you can make when you do this, when you're not working with the locals, you know, in a joint venture or something like that. And also, like I said about the joint ventures, governments maybe like joint ventures. Sometimes governments don't like 100% owned foreign direct investment products and, and companies. So there are those issues there. But the thing is, there's lots of other ways that companies can actually go abroad. I just wanted to give you some of the basic kind of global entry strategies that are out there so you can be better prepared if you're going to be taking your international marketing exam or your, your global business exam or something like that. Or if you just want to know, hey, what are some of the different ways that companies go abroad? So I hope this helps you know a little bit more. Um, I want to say thank you for watching. A thumbs up is always appreciated. If you like business videos like this or you want to learn more, hit that subscribe button. We put up basic marketing videos, advanced marketing videos, fun business videos, YouTube training videos all kinds of stuff. So we do appreciate it. And we'll say bye from here in Rwanda.
Hey there, fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're at the Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. And today we're going to talk about is how do companies choose their global marketing strategy? What are some of the things that influence us when we're actually figuring out our four P's, but for the global setting? Because maybe we have to have different products because the people drive on the other side of the road, so I need a different kind of car, right? Well, for example, here in Tanzania, they drive like in the UK, not like in the US, so I need to make a car that fits there. Or maybe look at pricing. Maybe we need to adjust for that. Some places they have laws that don't let you have sales on certain times of the year. And then we might look at the place where we're going to sell our products. Do they have a lot of retail shops? Do I need to do it online? What do I need to do to get my product out to the place? Also, how are we going to promote to those clients? What are we going to do? And that could be different. Are there different laws out there? Is different ways that people like to be advertised to? We have to think about all those things. And when we start looking down deep in some of the specifics, one of the things we have to look at are what are called cultural nuances. What are those things, what are those differences that make that culture its own culture? For example, in the US, if you want to get around, you take an Uber, or maybe you take a taxi or a Lyft to get around. Well, here in Tanzania, they have motorcycle taxis that drive you different places. In Rwanda, right next door, there's actually bicycle taxis that will take you places. And those are some of the things that make the country different. So if we're an advertiser that's used to advertise on the side of taxis, well, now we might need to think of something different because if all we have are motorcycle taxis and bike taxis, hmm, maybe we need to do something different for that. I mean, think about it. What would Uber have to do in order to survive in Rwanda? Because you know what? It's bike taxis, not, you know, car taxis. So we kind of think about those things. Now, the next thing we might look at are subcultures that are out there, okay? So what are the different groups that are within that country we want to go to? Here in Tanzania, there's over 120 different tribes here with 120 different languages and cultures and kind of stuff like that. And, and so you kind of think about it, it's like, well, hmm, that, that's a lot of different cultures I might have to focus on. So what do we need to do to reach out to each one of the different ones? Or do we find some similarities here, okay? Because what you'll see is there might be 120 different languages for all the 120 different tribes that are here, but they all speak Swahili. It's kind of the, the business language, everyday language. The other popular language here is English. So maybe we do like a Swahili or an English language based you know, promotion schedule here in Tanzania versus 120 different kind of things. But we have to think about that. Or if you want to look at a European example, think of a place like Belgium. You've got Flanders where they speak Dutch or Flemish. And then you have Wallonia where they speak French, you know, so they're the French speaking Belgians. And so there's two kind of different cultures within there. And are the differences so big we have to market to them differently? Or is it maybe just a language thing? Because that's another thing we have to look at is are there any, you know, kind of language barriers out there that we have to think about? Now, another thing we have to think about is, hey, how is our product viewed in that new market? OK, so, for example, if you're from the US or, or the UK or someplace like that or Canada, you think McDonald's, you think, oh, that's cheap fast food. Well, when I used to live in Lithuania, it wasn't cheap fast food. It was expensive fast food. I mean, it was one McDonald's meal could feed a family at a normal Lithuanian restaurant. And so you kind of think about that. It's like, huh, is our product seen as fancy or cheap or, or what is it? And so we have to think about those things because, you know, if I say Italian design, what's your perception? Oh, it's got to be cool because it's Italian. If I say German engineering, you know, oh, it must be good. Right. And from there, we have to think how will we position our product in that new market. Will we go for the exact same thing as before or do we switch it up? I know when I used to live in Germany, I was always surprised when I go and see Levi's in the store and they had their own Levi's store and they were like fancy, expensive jeans. And when I think back to like when I lived in the US at that time, it was like, wait a minute, Levi's jeans are like my dad's cheap jeans that he wore. They're not cool. But in this new market, they're positioned as cool because you might think about that. Maybe we can position ourselves differently. I know for a lot of people, if you think Honda, you think cars. Well, in Japan, you say Honda, a lot of people think motorcycles. So there's this different way of how we're perceived, but also how we want to position ourselves in this new market because we can change how we're seen in this new market because we can create our own brand identity there. Another thing we might look at is, are we going to use a single positioning model or multiple positioning model? Are we just going to have Toyota cars or is it going to be like in the U.S. market where we have Toyota as the middle class and cheap cars, but our fancy cars are the Lexus brand. So you have to think about that. And then we have to think about is, hey, am I going to have to adapt my product to this new market? So, for example, here in Tanzania, there's a lot of Toyota Land Cruisers that take people on safari tours here through the Serengeti. But the thing is, in Tanzania, it's a former British colony and they drive on the left side of the road. So the steering wheel is on the right side. So that means we have to adapt the market. We got to sell 
cars that are built in a different way. Now, another thing we have to look at when we're going to this new market is what's the needs of that new market? Do they really need our product? The thing is, is the McDonald's and Burger Kings and Starbucks that have become all over the world, fast food, symbols of fast food. The thing is, when they went to these new markets, they saw the new market didn't have a lot of fast food options. Maybe there was a bratwurst stand in Germany or a corner coffee shop in, in Berlin or something like that. But the thing is, is there wasn't a lot there and the market needed that. People are working longer hours, they have less free time, and so we wanna get our food quicker. Hey, the market needed us. I'm not saying they did need McDonald's everywhere, but hey, there was a need in the market. And so if you see that, hey, we can take advantage of that, okay? So you might look and see if we're a bank hey if we are really good at retirement planning what if we move to a country that didn't have a lot of retirement planning we could really clean up in that market so you kind of think about those things other thing we have to look at is the level of economic development in the country we're going to go to the literacy level in the country we're going to go to because that's going to influence our pricing or our, our communication strategy or promotion strategies also we have to think about the technical standards are there different rules is there different voltages and stuff like that for example here in tanzania the plug they're like in the UK. It's like these three weird prongs in there. So I can't use my US prongs and plug it in right away or I'll blow up my computer and I don't want that to happen. So I have to adapt those kind of things. Also, we can just think of overall cultural differences that are out there. How do people dress? How do people act? What are the important days? Think about differences in religions. What's the day off? Is it Sunday? Is it Saturday? Is it Friday? Is it no day? We have to think about all those things because those are going to influence us when we're going into global markets. And we go into global markets, I kind of think of like just kind of three different ways you can kind of go in with your products. And the first type of product I see us going global with is just selling the exact same product we already make. I mean, think about it. Boeing, they make airplanes and pretty much anybody in the world, we're all pretty much the same, right? Doesn't matter if you're in Tanzania or in Brazil or the US or China, you know, we all sit on our butts and we fly to different places. So airplanes can be pretty much the same product anywhere you go, right? Okay, maybe we paint the outside, it says Delta instead of Air China, but it's pretty much the same plane we see. Also, gasoline. We don't need to change it up for different countries. It's the same kind of stuff, the same standards, the same engines kind of thing. So we can just sell that same kind of product. So think commodity products, we can just sell the same anywhere. We don't really have to do anything different to it. So we're selling that same product everywhere. Now, the second thing we can do is actually sell products that are very similar to what we already make. So McDonald's does a great job with this when they go around the world because they try to take into account religious differences, taste differences, demand differences of people and things like that. And so they'll develop products for that. So, you know, they do sell McDonald's in Germany does sell beer. You can have that because that market wants it. And we sell other drinks, so it's kind of similar. But I think a better example is when McDonald's is like in India, where the cow is a sacred animal, they don't sell beef burgers. They sell more chicken burgers, right? So you see more chicken options that look like a McChicken or a Southern chicken sandwich or or, or whatever, and they, they kind of adjust to it. Also, maybe the spices and flavors in their food, they might change a little bit. You know, like Coke will have, you know, Coke with, made with sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup. Very similar product, but just a little bit of differences out there. And then what we could do for our third option is we can create completely new products we've never made before for this new market. Because we see, look, we have this whole new market. It's like an open temple. It's like the open savanna here in the Serengeti. There's so much that we could do. It's so open. What could we do instead to change things? And sometimes you'll see companies actually completely change their kind of position, their brand in different markets. I mean, I know in the US, I talk about this a lot. Levi's is, is the old man jeans. But in Germany, where I lived there, it was the cool jeans. They have all these cool different styles and stuff like that. I'm like, yeah, man, those are cool Levi's. My dad would never wear those, but I'd totally wear those. And it's kind of funny because they really took that new market and saw, hey, there's a whole market we can go into here. It's a fresh palette. We can do something new with it. And they did. They came with new products to go into that new market. So they're positioned very differently than their home market. Okay. So I hope this helps you know a little bit of how companies need, what well, some of the things they need to think about when they're developing their four P's for the international market and their global marketing strategy. If you want to learn more, maybe market interest strategies like exporting or direct investment, you want to learn about that or other business topics, why don't you subscribe to our channel? We put out business videos every week to help marketers, entrepreneurs, YouTubers, business students learn more about marketing, business, YouTube, and all kinds of stuff. And I wish you all the best and I hope you have a great day studying if you're studying for exam. I hope this helps you learn a, bit, a little bit more about business and marketing and going abroad. And um, if you go to our other channel, we actually have videos about going to the Serengeti as well. Anyway, I'll say bye from Tanzania.
Hey there fellow marketers, Professor Walters here, and today we're here in Rwanda. And today we're gonna to talk about are some of the ways that companies can get their new products into new global markets. And what we're gonna kind of look at is adaption. Like, do we need to adapt our product or do we need to adapt the language or communication system we use or, or a combination of both? Or can we just do the same thing everywhere? And so I kind of want to go through these four different um, ways we can go into a new market, okay? So one thing you might see is what we call a straight extension. This is where you can use the same communication strategy and sell the same products as you do in your home market. So for example, you always see a coach and a smile kind of commercials everywhere around the world and coke tastes pretty much the same everywhere around the world the big mac meal you know big mac fries and a coke that's something that they sell in the u.s they sell here in rwanda they sell all over the world that mcdonald's kind of feel you have that and so when you're introducing a product that doesn't really need to change much for the environment or change much for the language or or change much at all usually just going to do a straight extension of your normal product okay now sometimes though you might need to do what's called a communication adoption okay here here, basically what you're doing is you're selling the same product at home, exact, pretty much the exact same product, but you might need to change how you sell it or how you advertise it or how you communicate the value based on differences in that culture. It could be the language barrier. It could be a cultural barrier, all kinds of like legal restriction of what you can and can't say in commercials. These kind of things can really influence you because think about it. You know, there's the old song. What does the fox say? Well, what does what does the cow say? I mean, think about it. If the cow says moo in your country and says mew in another country, well, how can I use move on over to cows the limit? Well, if moo isn't spelled the same way and the words aren't the same you do have some issues and there are some funny stories with these like the chevy nova you know was it was a car a cool car you know and the chevy nova exploding star that's so cool but in latin america it didn't sell very well because nova means doesn't go i mean are you gonna buy a, a car that's called doesn't go or a sandwich called tastes bad of course not so you do have that so you might need to adapt the communication strategy that's why it's called communication adaption okay now the next thing you might see is what we call a product adaption. Here, we can use the same communication strategy at home, no problem there, but we might have to just adapt the product itself. And so it might be that we're, de we're developing these products that are really tailored more for that market we're going to. So this might be, for example, Ford, okay? They sell cars all over the world, but the commercials you see for Ford around the world are pretty similar. So the communication strategy, what they're gonna focus on is Ford toughness and Ford quality. We're gonna keep that, that, that same communication strategy, but when we're selling our cars in you know, the UK, Okay, well, we need to make a new product, right? Because we have to put the steering wheel on the right side of the car, not the left side of the car. So we're adapting that product and hence why it's called product adaption. And then you have what's called dual adaption. This is where you might find that your communication strategy used in your home market and the products used at your home market don't really fit with the market you're going to, or maybe you see another opportunity out there for you to maybe have a whole new kind of product and a whole kind of new communication strategy. I know for me, when I moved to Germany when I was younger, I was surprised because I was used to Levi's being like your dad's jeans and, and Levi's is, you know, the stuff you got, you know, because it was a tough jeans kind of stuff. Stuff. And so they were like, you know, 35, 40 bucks at the store and there was nothing fancy about it. Just straight, you know, the 501s kind of stuff. And then I moved to Germany and like the, the Levi's jeans were different. We got the twisted ones where the, the seams are different. We got the fancy ones. And there was like all these different Levi's jeans I'd never seen before. And the communication strategies, the advertising was totally different. It was like hip and cool and stuff like that. Not the rugged Levi's kind of thing. And you'll see that sometimes you need to do that adaption because the dual adaption because because that's going to help you be more successful in that new market. And the thing is, you'll see companies maybe do for different products in their product portfolio, they might do different things for different products. Sometimes, hey, you know what, I can sell that Big Mac the same way all the time, but hmm, maybe in another place, I need to change up my chicken sandwich, maybe make it a bit spicier, you know, for, for a spicier market. So we kind of think about those things. So I hope this helps you understand some of the different adaptions that might happen when you go into a new market if we focus on products product and communication adaptions. So I hope that helps you out. If you're studying for an exam, good luck on your exam. Otherwise, have a great day. Bye from here in Rwanda. Hi guys, Mark here with Walters World. And today we're gonna to talk about is globalization and assessing global markets so companies can know what kind of marketing strategies they should use in the new countries that they go to.
Now, when people talk about globalization, uh, what you need to realize is globalization is just the process by which goods, services, you know, toys, like my Dr. Who TARDIS here, okay, money, information, how it passes across international borders, all right? And the thing is, over time, we've seen that the differences between countries and between, between cultures has kind of broken down. So there's not so many differences. So I can find a TARDIS toy for my kid. You can drink German beer whenever you want, anywhere in the world, okay? That pizza you eat, hey, you know what? If you're not from Italy, you didn't have it first. Okay, so that is globalization. It's the fact that we have so many different things from all over the world going together and we're becoming one more international playground out there. Now, if you ask, hey, how did globalization come about? Well, one, you started, it, used, it became easier to transport goods so you could have the big ships and stuff, but also it used to take six months to go from England to the U.S. Now it takes six hours, okay, in a plane. So the logistical side of things made it easier. We had, you know, the big containers you can ship stuff in, all kinds of stuff. Also what changes, basically there would be more standardization. So it's not a big difference, you know, if I, my plug here in Germany works the same plug in France. We don't have as many changes so we can start selling product in more places, okay? Also, Basically, the processes of making products became more global. We started making products in China. We started buying, you know, getting our, 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 you know, apples from Chile, all kinds of stuff. So all these things came together to help bring about globalization. So, if you're looking to assess global markets and try to decide where you should go and where you shouldn't go, there's four main areas that you're going to be assessing. One, you're going to do an economic analysis, so you're going to have these metrics out there to see what's going on. Two, you're going to look at the infrastructure and technology that's in that country that you're looking to move to. Three, you're going to look at the social cultural dynamics in that country to understand how they do business, how things work there. And then also the fourth thing is, how does that government deal with international trade, with international investments? And so these four are the main things that are going to actually influence you in your decision making. Now, if we start with an economic analysis, basically the better off a country is, the better chance you have of making money there. Because if people don't have any money for food, they don't have any money for your new product. Okay, so when you're looking at assessing this, you're looking at you know looking at the GDP of a country. You're looking at the purchasing power of the country. You know, yeah, you because know, you might have to adjust your prices. Say, hey, you know, if people make uh, five hundred dollars a month versus five thousand, hey, you're gonna have to adjust some prices here. Okay. Also, you look at the market size itself. I mean, is it a big market or how's the growth rate? Is it growing or shrinking? That will influence it. That's why 20 years ago, everybody went to China when China didn't have a lot of income because they know, hey, it's going to grow. It's going to be big. Okay, and now it is. All right, look at a picture from Shanghai from between 1990 and 2010. It is completely different, okay? Now, after you have the economic analysis, you look at what the, with the infrastructure, okay? How are the roads there? I mean, what's the transportation like there? Are there roads going to where you want to be? I mean, what's the supply chain going to be like? I mean, do we, do we use big trucks? Or do we have to have little, you know, bicycle people going there? That's going to influence you. How is commerce in that country? Are they used to, you know, is it a barter system? Is it straight payments? Do you have to do some kickbacks, which are illegal, okay, wherever you are? I mean, these things you have to look at. And also, communication, okay? You know, we think, oh, well, I'll just pull out my iPad here and uh, I'll just check out and see everything online. Well, the thing is, guys, if they don't have, you know, 3G, 4G, LTE networks, you can't use it. So you're like, okay, we need to do something here. Now it's going to be lots of mail versus email. These are things you have to think about when you're going into a, to a new market, okay? Now, the next thing you look at is social cultural analysis. And you basically want to use one of the big things is Hofstede's model, um, which I actually have a whole video just on that, so if you want to learn more about it. Basically what he did is he looked at he looked at what's power distance like in that country. So how, I mean, is, is, is your boss God? And you're like, yes, sir, yes, sir. Or is it equal? I mean, are you buddy-buddy with them? Second thing you look at is uncertainty avoidance. That's how they take risk. I mean, is it a country that accepts risk or a country that does not like risk? Okay, I mean, you, you, these kind of things. Because, you know, if they accept risk, hey, they're more likely to buy different and new products. If they are risk avoidance, well, I got to make, maybe I don't have 15 versions of Fanta. I just have two, Okay. Other things you look at individualism. I mean, what, is it a me, 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 me first country or is it a group first country? Okay, that's going to influence because think of your advertising. If it's a me first, you're all about the person making themselves better. And if it's a, you know, a group society, a more, you know, non individualistic society, then it's more, hey, we're part of the team kind of stuff. And then you look at masculinity, which 
is as sexist as it sounds. Basically, you look at this, how equal are people in that society, men and women? I mean, could everyone, is, is it like Finland where anybody, you know, it's 50-50 going all the way up? Or is it like other countries where, you know what, there is a glass ceiling for women. How are we going to deal with those things? Okay, that's going to be there too. And then you look at time orientation. Okay, the time orientation, you know, is it, is it now, 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 or is it that people think long term? Like the U.S., it's more short term, okay, time orientation. So that's why, hey, we want the stock price up today. I'm not thinking long term, I'm thinking now. How's that going to affect your investment? How's it going to go there? These kind of things. And then the fourth thing you look at is government actions. Okay, what will governments do? I mean, do they have tariffs there? I mean, are they going to tax you for coming in or for selling there? Or do they have quotas only limiting a certain number of products that are there? What's the chance they may boycott your country? So, uh-oh, they're not going to accept any products from the U.S., so how, how worried should I be? Also, do they have any, you know, trade agreements? I mean, hey, if you're in the EU, it's great. Once I get into one country, it can go everywhere, all right? With exchange controls, what you look at is how do countries control their exchange rates? Are they manipulating prices? Are they manipulating how it is? These things will matter because your exchange rate will influence your imports and exports to and from a certain country. So we've assessed the market out there. We've seen kind of where they stack up in terms of infrastructure, in terms of economic development, you know, the culture in general, how it is. But what are some other things that are going to influence our actual marketing strategy? Because we do that big assessment to figure out, yes, this is a country I can go to. But just because it looks like it's a great thing doesn't mean you're going to do the exact same thing you've done everywhere else. So when we're choosing a global marketing strategy, some things you have to look at is one, cultural nuances. What are the little differences in the culture there that can influence your business? So if you're McDonald's and you're looking to open up more restaurants in Spain or Portugal, well, what you got to realize is Spain and Portugal, they don't eat lunch until, you know, 1 o'clock. So there's no reason to open up your restaurants at 10, okay? So, okay, we need to adjust our timing, how we're going to be started, so where we're going to sell our products. Another thing you look at, are there subcultures in that country? Because the thing is, a country isn't just one culture. It's not one culture, one country. Sometimes there's multiple cultures in one country. If we look at Belgium, you have Flanders, where they speak Flemish, and you have the Walloons that speak French. And within there, there's two different cultures within one country. So how do we play with those things? Other things, you view, how, do, how do they view your product? You know, maybe in your home market, you're the cheap alternative, but in the new market, you're going to be the expensive alternative. And with that, hey, maybe we can do some different positioning. You know, I, I find it funny because, you know, we talk about Levi's and Wranglers in the U.S., and it's kind of, they're like cheap. My grandma wore them. My dad wears them. You know, I guess I wear them too. But still, you know, old people like me wear them. Where, you know, so they're like, you know, $40. But then if you go to Germany, there's a Levi's store that sells Levi's for $250. And I'm like, what? What? I don't understand. 200 euros, 250 Why would anybody pay that? Because they position themselves differently in different markets, which can be a good thing, you know, because you can open up yourself to a whole new brand of customers. Okay? And also, you look at, just in general, what kind of things do I need in order to adapt to the different markets out there? Okay? So, is there little things I need to do, big things I need to do? You know, if I'm going to a country, they have small roads. Maybe I don't sell the Hummer. I get a, you know, I sell a Ford Festiva or Fiesta or something like that. Okay? Other little things you might want to look at, you know, what about the needs of the target market? You may say, you know, I mean, we, we're Kohler. We sell toilets and, and showers and stuff like that, you know, shower heads. And we see, oh, well, the market we're going to, we're going to Argentina. And a lot of it is that the showers are actually, you know, the water's there. It's not coming through a pipe. It's there and you just heat it right at the thing. I mean, I travel around South America a lot and there's little times where I'm clicking a switch on inside the shower and turn the heater thing on. Oh, well, that's, that's a need for that market. We could do something for them. Okay. Um, other things, you know, difference in technical standards. You know, if you ever bought a DVD in the U.S. and try to take it back to Europe or buy one in Europe and bring it back to the U.S., it doesn't work because they have different standards out there. And the last thing you probably want to look at, and which is very important, is, you know, whether to adapt to the language. Because sometimes you can have products that have the completely wrong meaning. You know, if you call your car Nova, which is cool because, oh, it's an exploding sun. Oh, that's really cool. That's really great. But you try to sell it in Mexico, Nova means doesn't go. Okay, so look at the language differences. Or well, you need to change things or not. This will all influence it. So I hope that gave you a rough idea of, you know, what globalization is, how you assess global markets, and, you know, how that's going to influence you in terms of making your marketing strategy. Now, if you're looking at what you're finally going to do, there's basically three options. One, you're going to sell the same product everywhere in the world. You're not going to make too many changes, like an airplane, okay? 
Uh, two, you're going to be some slight changes. You know, McDonald's, you, you go anywhere in the world, you can tell it's McDonald's. But in different markets, they have some slight variations. You know, there's no Big Mac in India because, you know, don't eat beef. So there's, you know, more McChickens there, stuff like that. Or you sell a totally new product. You see that this market has a need and, you know, that won't work on our home market. You know, Coke can't team up with Jack Daniels to make Jack and Coke in the U.S. because it's so family friendly. But maybe in a new market, they could do that. I don't know. We're just saying. And then if you look at your four P's in there, your products, we've talked about this with the adaptions. Pricing, hey, you have to look at the different pricing models that are going to be in those countries because some countries you're not going to be able to do buy one, get one free because there's laws restricting that. Also, it might restrict on when you can have sales or how much you can put stuff on sales, all these things. All right. If you're looking at place, well, uh, the whole distribution channel, guys, you need to look, there's a whole... There's whole videos on international logistics because it is so complicated and it becomes a lot more complicated when you go abroad. And then if you look at international, you know, or global communications or global promotion, how, are you going to have the same, you know, the same commercials everywhere, or do you need, need to make those differences? So you go back to those cultural differences and see what's there. So I hope this gives you a rough idea of what's going on in the global market and how to assess a global market, how you should probably go about deciding if you should go abroad, or if you shouldn't go abroad, or how you should go abroad, all kinds of stuff. So for more marketing and business advice, please check us out at our website at www.waltersworld.com. Thanks. Ciao.